Welcome to Sage for H. Today we will launch a new series, the Science of the Time series. The idea is to discuss some of the most pressing issues characteristic of the times we live in. Today we will focus on the idea and the practice of unmasking. I have the honor to speak to Professor Peter Beer, who has devoted himself to unpacking the concept of unmasking and what it means in the world today. For a long time, Peter Beer was the research professor of social theory at Lingnan University in Hong Kong. Before coming to Hong Kong in 2000, he worked at universities in Canada and Britain. He teaches and writes mainly in the areas of social and political thought, political culture, and mass emergency. Aside from his position at Lingnan University, Professor Beer was also a Raymond Aron Fellow at Boston University and an Honorary Fellow at the University of Edinburgh. Professor Beer has published numerous articles and books, and his most recent book is The Unmasking Style in Social Theory. Welcome, Professor Beer. Thank you, John. Nice to see you. It's really nice to have you here to discuss uh, your book and the concept of unmasking. So, uh, yeah, let's uh, get down to business directly and uh, focus on this concept and try to unpack it. So, uh, what is unmasking and why is it relevant today? Unmasking has many aspects to it. And so, although I'll give a simple definition in a moment, it's best considered as, as a complex idea. Um, and in the course of the next you know, 40, 45 minutes, we can unpack it. Mm. But a simple definition of unmasking would be that unmasking is a type of accusation. It's a, it's a way of accusing somebody for heinous motives or for bad ideas. Another way of thinking about unmasking is to look at concepts that contrast to it, because often in social and political thought, we have a greater understanding of a concept if we can see what its opposite or its contrast is. So a, a contrastive concept would be disclosing. If I disclose myself to you, what am I doing? Well, I'm expressing what I think and what I feel. And I may also be disclosing things that I'm not aware of, like my accent, the sorts of clothes I wear, and people may extrapolate from those symbols. But disclosure is something that the subject does mm. in attempting to uh, reveal themselves or explain themselves. Mm. Unmasking is what somebody does to you. And this is not really uh, a matter of disclosing you. It's a matter of exposing you um, as a liar, as a hypocrite, or as having bad ideas. Another contrastive idea between un with, with unmasking is the term understanding. Now, if I say that I want to understand you, John, it means that I want to listen to you very carefully. I want to see how you make sense of your social world. I want to give credence to your situational rationality. But if I say, I want to unmask you, John, this is immediately a kind of threat. Uh, it's uh, an example of having an antagonistic relationship to you. So these are some of the meanings that cleave to unmasking. It's a kind of accusation. It is a negative appraisal. It is always done by somebody to somebody else. We do not unmask ourselves. We disclose ourselves. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, thank you for that clarification and that definition. So we have, in some sense, um, exposure of bad motives and exposure of bad ideas. Um, um, is it not sometimes called for to engage in unmasking? I mean, maybe a strange question, because there might be bad motives and there might be bad ideas, right? Well, you know, very occasionally we might want to think that unmasking is something justifiable. Mm. But the reasons that will become clear, I think, mm -hmm. um, it is something to, in general, be avoided. I think 
you know, we, we don't want to give up the idea totally of unmasking a hypocrite, somebody who pretends to be something that they're not. Mm -hmm. um, you can expose them and show that they are basically a liar. Mm -hmm. But unmasking ideas, I think, is far more problematic mm -hmm. because ideas are more complex things. Even when they appear to be simple ideas, mm -hmm. they're often simple just because of the lens that we bring to them. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I'll, I'll say that there may be instances when one wants to unmask. But generally speaking, I think uh, unmasking is a not just an unproductive way of, of thinking, mm. but a dangerous one. And it is noticeable that radical social movements that aim to create utopian societies, like the Jacobin, the French Revolution, and like the Bolsheviks and the Maoists, they all use this term unmasking, all of them, and they used it repetitively. Mm. So, you know, you can find it in French, you can find it in German, you can find it in Chinese, the mm. way this term is used again and again. Mm. And so this is a dangerous idea. Mm. And effectively, it turns an opponent into an enemy. Mm. I see. Thank you again. Um... Yes, so, so you refer to uh, unmasking as a rhetorical technique, or rather several uh, rhetorical techniques, five major rhetorical techniques, in fact. So we have weaponization, reduction, positioning, inversion, and deflation. Could you please exemplify them, or at least one or two of the techniques? Yeah, uh, I mentioned five in, in my book, mm -hmm. and since completing the book, I found several others of these unmasking techniques. And I'll explain a couple of them in a moment. But just let me say that a challenge of the book, um, of my thinking about the book, was that, of course, unmasking is used very generally. I mean, you can f you just, just Google it. So many things are unmasked. It's a, it's a generic concept. But the social scientist and the political thinker wants to bring specificity to the concept. Mm -hmm. And so my approach was to look at unmasking as a series of rhetorical techniques, mm -hmm. as what I call a style. And this is why my book is called um, The Unmasking Style of Social Theory. So I'm not concerned with just, you know, looking at unmasking generally. I, we're not going to get very far um, doing that. Anybody can do that. But we need to home in on specific rhetorical techniques, both in speech and in writing, that I believe exemplify unmasking. Yeah. And um, so, for instance, you know, weaponization is the extreme edge of accusation. What I mean by this is that in political life, it is normal to disagree with people. Um, we live in a plural society. And of course, as a result of that, there are going to be plural views. Conflict is normal. Disagreement is normal. Without disagreement, you wouldn't have progress in science. But weaponization refuses to accept the legitimacy of disagreement. And you notice this kind of uh, technique when the language begins to dehumanize the other person. Mm -hmm. So you, you, you start to hear people speaking of enemies of the people mm -hmm. or of apostates mm -hmm. or of vermin or of scum, things like this. And radical movements um, of the right and the left both use these terms. And so once you see these terms being used, um, you know that you have reached weaponization, which as I say, is not simple disagreement. Now you might think that academics being cognitive types of people would not use these terms, but actually they do use these terms. Mm -hmm. If one looks at the way in which American and other academics describe Donald Trump, for instance, um, the terms were often 
of this sort. They describe Trump as a demon. In, in, in the book and in other texts, I've got you know, chapter and verse on this. They compare Trump with Stalin and with Hitler, in other words, with mass murderers. So weaponization is this extreme edge of accusation. Another technique of unmasking of the five I mentioned, and I've now got about eight or nine, mm. is uh, deflation. Now, deflation is a rhetorical technique which attempts to immobilize a person's argument, to cut it off at its legs, as it were. And one way of doing this is to claim that a person's ideas or the person themselves is illusory or deluded. Um, and political argument is full of these claims. We don't like a line of argument. We claim that it is deluded. Now notice something about deluded and about the term illusion, is that if you say that a person is deluded, there's no point in arguing with them. Um, or if you say that a person is living under an illusion, there's no point in arguing with them either, because they're in effect inhabiting another reality. Another example of deflation, which is very common today, is the use of phobic language. And phobic language, as in Islamophobia or homophobia or xenophobia or ecophobia, and literally scores of other phobias, so-called, are very appropriate to modern civilization because since the early 20th century, we have increasingly lived in what could be described as a therapeutic culture, mm. where our problems are described in terms of dysfunction or wellness. Mm. And if you, uh, if you claim that somebody is an Islamophobe or a xenophobe, then again, of course, there is no point in arguing with that person. Mm. Uh, because you're saying, in effect, that person is mentally ill. And the idea of the agora in which people swap views becomes transformed into the clinic where somebody decides whether a person is sane enough to actually merit a discussion with. So these are the kinds of techniques, all the unmasking techniques seek really to immobilize arguments, to show that there is nothing in them, mm -hmm. that there is really no grounds for disagreement. Mm -hmm. There is only a sense in which one person is fundamentally wrong. Mm. I see. Uh, but if someone is stating something that is obviously racist, for instance, or if uh, someone is um, expressing hatred towards Muslims, could one not use those terms then, xenophobia and Islamophobia, for instance, or is it the terms that you have a problem with and you would prefer other terms instead of those? Well, I advise against any, any term with the word phobic, hmm. the suffix phobic attached to it. And the reason for this is that we have other terms already which do not imply this therapeutic mentality. Hmm. For instance, we have terms like intolerance, mm -hmm. um, bigotry, mm -hmm. prejudice. Mm -hmm. These are all legitimate terms. Mm -hmm. um, but once you go down the rabbit hole of phobia, mm -hmm. you are effectively creating another kind of parallel world in which you cast yourself as the therapist of another person seen now as a problem. Mm -hmm. So for example, there are, I think, legitimate reasons to be concerned with certain kinds of immigration, not with immigrants in particular, but one could argue that mass immigration to a country um, is going to create problems for that country on the basis of past evidence. Now, somebody who disagreed with me 
would be free to say, well, actually, you know, you're exaggerating this problem because people um, assimilate or they create their own communities and they can live in peace with each other. And then I might come back and I can say, well, you know, can you give me examples of that? And the person can say, yeah, well, actually, I can. So now we have a discussion. Now we have a real argument. But once the person says, well, essentially, you're a xenophobe, the argument is dead. It's mm. finished. There is no argument anymore. Mm. Mm. Um, it's like calling somebody an anti-Semite um, or any of these terms. Once you do that, you shut down a discussion. In effect, terms like phobic are a way of censoring discussion. Mm. Because once a person has been so described, as I say, there is no point in going any further. So we have alternatives that we can use, mm -hmm. and they're useful alternatives. And we had them before the term phobic became rampant in our culture. Mm -hmm. And they're useful terms because they are debatable terms. But terms like phobia and illusion are not debatable. Mm. I see. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. uh, so if we continue, um, you claim that writers or speakers who employ these techniques seek to facilitate the emancipation of persons, groups, or society as a whole. But is unmasking always intentional in that sense? I mean, it seems to me that a lot of the unmasking that we see on Twitter, for instance, is rather habitual and sometimes just outright dumb and vicious without much thought behind it. What do you make of that? I agree with you entirely. This is why in the book I make a distinction between what I call vernacular or popular unmasking on the one hand and theoretical unmasking on the other. So popular or vernacular unmasking is what we find repeatedly in journalism and social media. And this is where people call out each other's hypocrisy or bad motives or talk about various conspiracies. Mm -hmm. And then there's no idea of emancipation or, or liberty at all. There is just a, a complaint or a protest or an accusation. Mm -hmm. Theoretical unmasking is different. Mm -hmm. the, the unmaskers who, who are theorists from Rousseau onwards, uh, in the book I give special place to Marx, and one could also talk about critical theorists, one could talk about radical feminists, a variety of other thinkers. Um, these, these theorists repeatedly use the term liberation, emancipation. And the idea is that if you truly understand your condition, as the theorist sees it, as Marx sees it, or as a critical theorist sees it, um, then you will be able to slough off these bad ideas that you have and live rationally and well. But notice here that you require the theorist to be your guide. The theorist is an intellectual vanguard, rather like the party cell is the revolutionary vanguard. And so radical social theory of all kinds is about emancipation. So it requires to be emancipated um, following the leadership of people who supposedly know more than you do. And again, the idea of emancipation is a very crude one because emancipation, if you see how this is used, um, emancipation is either extremely violent in certain revolutionary movements, it's about exterminating whole classes of people, or it implies that people can agree on fundamentals and that at the moment they are rationally befuddled. But a theorist can help clarify this and help people see their true interests or their real interests. Um, and dispel the false consciousness that pervades society like a fog. But in the real world, we know that there are very fundamental disagreements 
about all sorts of things. For example, about abortion, about uh, same-sex marriage, about immigration, about politics, whether you're a socialist or a conservative, about religion, whether you are a secularist or whether you are a religious person. These ideas are fundamental. They're what Max Weber understood as conflicts of value, not just of, of belief. And again, in a plural universe, which is the universe we happen to live in, you're gonna have plural disagreements and they're very fundamental. But the unmasking style in the uh, visage of a unmasking theorist believes that this can all be dispelled as if we can live in a common and harmonious universe. But is it not possible to um, use the concept of emancipation or engage in yeah, emancipatory movements or even engage in or using the theoretical concept of emancipation without unmasking? It is, it, is it necessarily connected to unmasking? It may be. I mean, emancipation is a very, very big concept. I'm not saying that emancipation is necessarily unmasking, but I'm mm -hmm. saying that theoretical unmasking is accompanied by a concept of emancipation. I see. I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, uh, as you have already mentioned, uh, Karl Marx features extensively in your book. Uh, could you please elaborate on what type of unmasking Marx used to deploy? Well, I give Marx special consideration because he employs all the unmasking techniques of the unmasking style. And all what, of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, all of them. So I, I can't, I don't, I don't want to go. Yeah, no, no. no I don't want to yeah. go through all of them. But, but maybe some of the more know, common yes. themes that we are yes. aware of in connection to the bourgeoisie or in maybe well, in relation take, to religion. Well, you know, what one technique that I refer to in, in the book is inversion, where you turn somebody's words round mm. to mean something that they don't actually mean. Um, or you invert reality. So for example, Marx excels in these kinds of inversions. He says that God did not make humans. Um, God is the creation of humans or man-made God. Um, that the, the longer the, the worker works, the poorer the worker becomes. Law is not the foundation of society, but society is the foundation of law. So we have a kind of rhetorical move here in which everything is sort of upside down to begin with, and the unmasking theorist turns it on its feet. And I argue in the book that Marx's critique of religion precedes his critique of political economy, and the, the techniques that he uses in his early works on religion are essentially recapitulated um, in the work on, on capitalism. Marx extensively weaponizes his arguments too. Uh, unless it's a few intellectuals he admires who, who are safely dead and gone like, uh, like Adam Smith, when Marx is face-to-face uh, -face with his rivals in the socialist movement or in the anarchist movement, um, he is utterly vicious, um, rather like Lenin. You know, he describes these people you know, as scum and as vermin. And Marx, this is not really understood, I think, enough by people. Marx is an exterminatory thinker. Um, he, he, he is a class cleanser. His belief in a society where there, you can purge all divisions and you can create a unified human being, what he calls community or social humanity, is a world without politics. And unlike Rousseau, who is... Um, 
has a positive theory of politics, which we find in the social contract and elsewhere. Marx has no positive theory of politics. Marx doesn't believe in politics because for Marx, politics is an expression of civil society, of, uh, of a world in, in competition, which you have to get rid of. Now, of course, uh, Marx believed that you should use politics on the way to communism, um, particularly for revolution and as far as the dictatorship of the proletariat is concerned. But eventually we would live in a post-political world, which for him means a world without political divisions. Because for Marx, political divisions are based on social divisions. And once you've got rid of social divisions, you've got rid of political divisions too. This is a very, very dangerous way of thinking. And yet, as we know, for over a century, um, thousands upon thousands of intellectuals have embraced it. I see. Thank you for that um, elaboration on Marx. But if we... Uh contrast or perhaps not contrast if we bring up another class uh, classical thinker uh, Nietzsche which you also discuss in the book uh, you argue that his reflections on the mask and masking reveal something more complex than Marx could you please elaborate on that well there's an evolution in thinking in in Nietzsche's thought about unmasking, the term is, is used by him and its cognates are used like unveiling or uncloaking. And, you know, he begins in a rather simple way, you know, he's going to unmask religion. He's going to show, for example, that Christianity, which claims to be a religion of compassion, in fact, is a, a slave morality, is a sublimated will to power. This is classic inversion. So it's not compassion, it is domination. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, he wants to unmask Christianity for that. But as, as he goes on, Nietzsche has second thoughts or third thoughts or fourth thoughts about unmasking as, as a concept and as a metaphor. And he ends up saying something like, we've got to avoid unmasking because everybody needs a mask to protect themselves against the absurdity of the world and of accusers and of people who would hurt and destroy them. So from unmasking being a form of destruction itself, Nietzsche comes to the position that Masking is a, a psychological protection. Mm. And why would you want to get rid of people's masks and say that you see through them? That itself is an act of violence against them. And in more modern times, sociologists who are watching this podcast may recall the ideas of Irving Goffman, famous for his work on the presentation of self in everyday life. And Irving Goffman is the great theorist of the mask, who is absolutely against unmasking. So he shows the way that we all try to put on our best face. And we do this through the clothes we wear, um, and through, the, uh, through our manners, and through a variety of other techniques which he itemizes at length. Mm -hmm. But the implication of, of Goffman is people do this to protect themselves in a hostile world, mm -hmm. people who feel vulnerable. Um, why would you want to unmask them? Why would you want to make their lives worse than they already are? So there is a deep compassion mm -hmm. in Goffman's work. Mm -hmm. Now, he's not a sentimental thinker. And his work is deeply and densely conceptual. But there is a pathos in Goffman's work. And there is a pathos in the later work of Nietzsche on this issue of masking and unmasking. Mm. Interesting. So he started out as an unmasker, so to speak, but then eventually came to embrace the mask. Well, he, you know, maybe not exactly embrace it, but, mm. but defend it. Mm, yeah okay yeah mm. okay so um let us continue uh, you distinguish between unmasking uh bad motives and unmasking bad ideas 
Could you please give contemporary empirical examples of both types of unmasking? I know you have already touched upon some examples, but is it possible to say something more about it? Well, let's take as an example of unmasking bad motives. You'll have to remind me perhaps to come back to bad ideas, but I, we've yeah. already discussed them a fair bit. Yeah. Um, for a contemporary example, think of the discussion or the lack of discussion thereof about the Ukraine-Russian war. Mm. Um, think particularly about people who have what they consider to be a more complicated view um, mm. about this war than the legacy media, the, the BBC and uh, the CBC and the ABC and a variety of other national equivalents. Mm. People like John Mearsheimer, for instance, mm. yeah. or- I was Stephen, actually going to ask about that. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, or, or, yeah. or Stephen Cohen, now Stephen Cohen is dead, but he and Mearsheimer had pretty well identical views about the nature of this crisis. And um, as you know, um, and as your listeners and, and, and watchers may know, Mishimer's view is that the main actor responsible for this crisis is the West um, by pressing NATO closer and closer to Russia's borders and creating in Russia what looks like to them um, a, an existential threat. And we're, we're reminded by people like uh, John Mearsheimer that the United States has a Monroe Doctrine, um, which prohibits foreign powers from even coming into the Western mm -hmm. hemisphere, mm -hmm. which is believed to be their sphere of influence. So there's a clear double standard here. But getting away from the double standard, there is the argument that by in three tranches, since the end of the First Cold War of expanding NATO ever closer to Russia's borders, the West was creating this crisis. Now, people may and have described Mearsheimer and others who hold their views as Putin puppets mm -hmm. um, or as apologists for Russian revanchism, mm -hmm. um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That is a form of unmasking in my sense. Mm -hmm. And instead of arguing the case and sitting down with people like Mearsheimer mm -hmm. um, and with others who believe that, um, they, they refuse to do that. They're not interested in doing that. They simply accuse him of something which he denies. Mm -hmm. So this is a kind of um, unmasking. It's a thing that we have at the moment, but Unmasking is a pervasive weapon of accusation where you don't have to bother about disagreement with somebody. You just simply abolish their significance and make them a non-person mm -hmm. in discussion. Now, as it happens, we still have the ability to listen to people like John Mearsheimer through YouTube, and he has not been taken off it. But we also know that over the last couple of years, a whole number of opinions, which have been considered to be misinformation and disinformation, including opinions that later turned out to be true, mm -hmm. were um, taken off and uh, debarred from uh, polite listening from, from you know, a whole variety of, of social media, Facebook and, and, and Google and others. So it's a very important that we understand that once people stop engaging with other people as fellow citizens with different views, but instead seek to unmask them as enemies or as phobic personalities or as deluded, once you do the latter, you're, you've entered a very, very dangerous territory. Everybody complains these days of tribalism mm. and polarization, but unmasking tribalizes mm -hmm. and polarizes. Mm -hmm. And in my view, what divides us in as, as, as 
thinkers, as writers, and in intellectuals more generally, is less what we disagree about, though that does divide us, but more the way we disagree mm -hmm. um, or the way we refuse to actually disagree and engage. Mm -hmm. And it's this that I'm very concerned about, because I think that until we become more thoughtful mm -hmm. about our disagreements with people and how we do it, and whether we want to disagree with them or whether we want to simply eliminate them and abolish them, mm -hmm. um, until we, we sort this one out in our own minds, we are going to create a situation which is even more extreme mm -hmm. than it is now. And we know that extreme situations sooner or later produce very dangerous consequences. Mm. It's interesting that you mentioned the example of John Mearsheimer because um, it seems to me that that is um, a clear case of unmasking and the accusation of Putinism. And it actually, at the very moment in Sweden, um, there is uh, a discussion, or actually not so much of a discussion, it seems that um, the uh, government uh, has decided that they want to join NATO, even though we don't know for sure, but... Um, they are talking about it at least as if they have decided already that they want to join NATO. And those who oppose um, Sweden joining NATO have also been called Putinist, for instance. There is a famous researcher in Sweden that has been accused of being a Putinist uh, uh, for opposing uh, NATO membership or at least desiring greater public discussion about this very fundamental security decision that cannot be rushed. Uh, so uh, yeah, those are very interesting contemporary examples. Um, um, uh, do we have examples as well of um, unmasking of bad ideas? Did you touch upon that or was it uh, just the first? Uh, should we put this in terms of a bad motive category or do we mix them somehow? Well, I think that one mixes them. Yeah, yeah. Because the, 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 the idea there mm. is that the West bears significant if not the major responsibility not for the invasion as such but for the crisis that produced the invasion or that prompted it mm. and mm. notice how simplistic it is to describe people like Mearsheimer or the person you referred to in Sweden as a Putin puppet I mean it, it's almost it's almost childish in its simplification mm. um, but notice that when we talk about unmasking, we have to appreciate that unmaskers are often themselves imposing a mask on somebody else, which they don't actually have. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the professor mm -hmm. you refer to mm -hmm. may actually think that Vladimir Putin is a very dangerous person um, and that Russia is an authoritarian state. But that doesn't matter to the unmasker. The unmasker puts on yeah. the mask of being a Putinist and then miraculously takes the mask off. <laughs> so this is the way unmasking works. I should have really clarified that at the beginning that yeah. unmasking is as much the imputation. <coughs> Excuse me, I've got a bit of a cold. Yeah, yeah no worries. Is, is the attribution or imputation of a mask. Mm -hmm. As, as much as it is the claim to remove one. Yeah, 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 true. Yeah, because we, yeah, exactly. Because you put the mask of Putinism <coughs> on the person. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, mm, uh, interesting. So um, it seems to me that the practice of unmasking, uh, that the practice of unmasking is rampant and ubiquitous, at least on Twitter and in the political sphere. Um, is it even possible to envision the political sphere without unmasking? Probably not, because unmasking is so easy to do. Everybody unmasks from the right and from the left. Um, it's a lazy way of criticism, as all dismissal is. And because it is so easy and also because it is so satisfying, um, it is a constant temptation. And as we know, human beings, us being what we are, uh, where we have difficulty resisting temptation of all sorts. Mm. But I do think that the more aware we become of unmasking, 
the more we can avoid doing it ourselves and we can look for other ways to criticize our opponents and these forms of criticism do not have to be bland you know they can be very very well argued and they can be tough mm -hmm. but by definition to have an argument or discussion means that you have at least to consider that the other person is sincere in what mm -hmm. they believe mm -hmm. and has reasons mm -hmm. for their beliefs mm -hmm. and one is trying to unpack what those are and also to provide counter reasons that one possesses mm. yeah yeah so a rational debate instead of a rational discussion instead of ad hominem attacks but uh, yeah we might not be able to expect that in the political sphere, but in contrast to uh, politicians then, when it comes to academics, we should at least expect academics to be able to engage in some kind of Habermasian rational deliberation, so to speak. But the title of your book, The Unmasking Style in Social Theory, imply that many times they do not. What are some of the most common rhetorical unmasking styles that scholars use? Well, let me just go back briefly to what we were saying before about political unmasking. Mm, yeah, yeah. Because the way you rephrased my comment, not unreasonably, by the way, was to mm. talk about rational discussion. Mm. But I don't, I don't want to try and I don't want to say that it's rational discussion as such, in mm. as much as politics is is heated. Yeah, yeah, certainly. You know, it, it, it deals with important stakes. Mm. And it's not something that is anemic. You know, people feel passionately about things. Mm. But you can still feel passionately and not unmask. Mm. You can be conscious that whenever you're about to demonize a person, you simply don't do it. Mm. That you don't use unmasking language. Mm. And once you stop doing that, Mm. then you may stop doing other things as well. So I don't want to actually imply a Habermasian yeah. cleanse space. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think Habermas's view of politics is among the most unreal um, representations of okay. the political it is possible to imagine. Okay. And notice... That, That's interesting. And, and notice also about Habermas... Mm. Though Habermas is a, is a deeply intelligent and serious and sincere thinker, mm. he has a concept of emancipation. Yeah, 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 um, yeah. And he also has an idea that somehow, if people can uh, have a, a discussion that is free of distorted discourse, mm. they're going to come to an agreement. Mm. But distorted discourse for Habermas, for mm. another person, mm. is actually a different way of living. Mm -hmm. It is, is a different set of stakes. Mm. So Habermas is somebody who wants to commensurate all these things. Mm -hmm. It's a profoundly anti-Weberian way of thinking. Mm. And mm. I, I, mm. I'm, I'm a Weberian in this, in this respect, at least, that I think that given we live in a pluriverse, mm. Um, of plural beliefs and underpinning them plural values. Mm -hmm. Conflict is inevitable. There mm -hmm. is no way of cleansing it or purifying it. In mm -hmm. fact, to purify it is a very dangerous idea. Mm -hmm. And even though Habermas um, is the most pacific of people mm -hmm. and is, is seeking to create a, a good society, mm -hmm. the model that he is using I think is one which is anti-political because politics is about conflict mm -hmm. and um, there is no way of escaping it unless one creates a totalizing world where only one ideology is allowed to mm -hmm. exist. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank Oh, sorry. Thank you for that clarification. Um, thank you very much for that clarification. Um, but should we... Um, still say something perhaps about the most common rhetorical unmasking styles that scholars use if it even is it even possible to say something like that about the most common styles yeah so all, all the critical theorists use the techniques i mentioned in the book mm. with the exception perhaps of weaponization and as mm. we're talking about marx and lenin 
mm. and the revolutionaries. Mm. Um, and the way to think about unmasking too is as a sort of a spectrum. Mm. The, the more techniques a person uses, mm. um, the, the greater the, the unmasker they happen to be. So it's a continuum can, or a spectrum. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. You know, okay. but, but somebody can use one or two techniques and in, to that extent, you know, they're not heavily unmasking. Mm. And others can use the whole gamut. Mm. Marx uses the whole gamut. The critical theorists use almost the whole gamut. Radical feminists use almost the whole gamut. Um, a number of radical social theorists almost use the whole gamut. Um, and they use the, the techniques that I have described. Now, it is sometimes said to me, well, Peter Baer, um, you've written this book on the unmasking style, but and, and you obviously don't like the style and you show many reasons why it's problematical, but are you not yourself an unmasker? Yeah. Are you not unmasking the unmasking style? And my answer to that is I'm not, um, because I don't use any of the techniques of unmasking against those I criticize nor do I put words into their mouth, nor do I claim that they are deluded in any way. Mm. So unmasking, and unless you mean unmasking very generally, that somebody reveals something which they don't happen to like, um, unless you mean that, and I began by saying that if social science is going to do anything interesting with unmasking, it's to make it more precise. Mm. Um, but if you, if you define unmasking in the way that I do, which is a way that is precise, I am not unmasking those people who I disagree with. Mm. On the contrary, I'm showing that they use these unmasking techniques. And then I'm showing why I think that they are problematical. Mm -hmm. But at least of all, am I trying to emancipate anybody? I treat people as equals mm. and they will are free to treat me as an equal to and retort, fire back. Mm. Um, I don't put myself above them. I don't claim to be anybody's guide. Mm -hmm. I'm not part of a vanguard. I'm trying to understand something. Mm -hmm. And if people disagree with my understanding, then, you know, go ahead. I think this is great. This is part of the uh, very part of the bloodstream mm. of, uh, of scholarly discourse. Mm. Mm. Okay, so when you um, critiqued Habermas, uh, you mentioned Max Weber. And, and given that you have engaged and written about Max Weber throughout your career, it would be interesting to hear your perspective on Weber specifically. Because it seems to me that Verstein or Verstein or understanding is the opposite of unmasking. But Weber was also engaged in political debates of his time. Did Weber manage to avoid? Uh, to, did did Weber manage to avoid unmasking, or did he succumb to it as well? In his political writings, he succumbs to it. Hmm. Um, he he unmasks the the Bismarck state, um, the aristocrats, the Junkers, and several others people who he disagrees with. Hmm. He unmasks them. So. In politics, Weber is pretty unrestrained um, about unmasking in his polemics, for example, in some of the writings for the Frankfurter Zeitung. But in his sociology, Weber is very careful to avoid unmasking. And as you say, the concept of Verstehen or understanding is the antithesis of unmasking, because Weber is saying that sociology is an interpretive discipline. And in order to explain why people do things, we have to understand why they do. We have to understand their motives, but we also have to understand the situations that people inhabit, which make the motives seem reasonable to them. So in Weber's celebrated study of the Protestant ethic in the spirit of capitalism, as you know, um, a lot of the book is devoted to trying to understand the sectarian mentality of the Baptists and the Calvinists and others, and how they made sense 
of their lives and the purpose of their lives and the impact this had on creating some of the ideas that in turn created the spirit of modern bourgeois capitalism. So understanding is a, a kind of empathetic approach. It doesn't mean that one agrees with it or one even likes it, mm. but one is trying to see the world as the subjects see them. Mm. And by doing so, explain how it is that they did the things they did and with what consequences. Mm. So that is a radically anti-unmasking view. It's a penetrating view. Mm. It is an investigation. It's very thoughtful. It's, it's profound. Mm. It requires a lot of work. Mm. And as mentioned, unmasking requires no work at all, particularly where it's polemical. You just simply have to use a few terms that mm. suggest that somebody is uh, you know, pathological or deluded, and that's the end of it for the most part. Now, Weber was much more sophisticated than that. And in a number of his newspaper articles that he wrote up, um, you have much, much more analysis mm. Um, than you do unmasking. So for example, his great work written towards the end of the First World War on parliament and government in a reconstructed Germany shows why parliament, a rigorous parliament is necessary for Germany and why the Caesarist kinds of politics were such a disaster for it. But this is not unmasking, you know, mm. and most of that, um, that article, which began with newspaper articles, is a, a very long and very dense analysis of German constitution and of other constitutions that Weber thinks Germany could borrow from. So this is a kind of a forensic for the most part, not an unmasking, not a dismissal, mm -hmm. attempt to really grasp things and then apply them and make suggestions in terms of policy for Germany. Mm -hmm. But in between, there are the kind of barbs and the attacks, um, the unmasking attacks on Weber's opponents. Mm. Interesting. And not in the sociology. The sociology is completely free of unmasking mm -hmm. and Weber never ever comes close to it mm -hmm. and it, it seems to me that you know he was very aware that if you wanted to have a scientific discipline um uh, a science of interpretation unmasking was a disaster mm -hmm. and anthropologists have followed him closely in this the ethnographic method mm -hmm. is really Weber's um Verstein or understanding Mm -hmm. applied and expanded uh, mm -hmm. people. The anthropologist goes to live with a group of people or to observe them very closely and records how they make sense of their world. And the anthropologist's role is not to judge these people, um, but just to understand them and convey their understandings to readers. Of course, anthropology being a scientific discipline adds its own concepts to the mix mm. um, to provide value added as it were. But anthropology, at least at its best, does not condemn subjects. You can look at all kinds of very, very weird, crazy people from our, our standpoint. But the anthropologist always wants to know what makes sense to these people? Why are they doing what they are doing? Mm. Um, how have they come to this? and with what consequences. So again, it's a kind of empathetic approach and that is an anti-unmasking approach. Interesting. So even though uh, Weber's concept of Verstehen uh, is the opposite to unmasking and even though he displayed considerable sophistication in his political analysis and his political writings, he did uh, engage in some type of unmasking. So in some sense, Weber was human too. <laughs> Well, it's, it's even a bit more than that, because yeah. we have to recall that Weber's theory of the modern, um, which consists of a number of different life orders, mm -hmm. each of which is governed by its own laws, mm -hmm. uh, as it were. So you have the, the life order of art, mm -hmm. you have the life order of politics, you have the life order of eros, you have the life order of science. Each of these, something was appropriate to. 
And the reason why Weber is so against mixing science and politics mm. is that he says these are different, these are different life orders which have their own logics. Mm -hmm. And you know, to confuse them is to make a mess of both. Mm -hmm. For a politician to claim that their views are scientific, mm. whereas other persons are unscientific. For Weber, is just a, an illegitimate way of arguing. You know, mm. argue as a citizen, wow. but um, don't, because, argue, yeah. don't, 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 don't claim science mm. for your political views. Mm. Um, anybody can do that. They can find some other finding to defend their views. Um, well, we hear si today we hear science all the time. Exactly. Every exactly. political decision, particularly during the pandemic and now. Well, even uh, worse, we heard about something called the science. Yeah, yeah, the as, science. As exactly. Science is, is, is monolithic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas, as is often said, you know, really yeah. science is, is not a thing as such. It's not a finding. It's a method. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, fundamental to the scientific method yeah. is disagreement, is mm -hmm. revision. Mm. is checking, is mm. refutation. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. But once you hear people talking about the science, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know suddenly science has become heavily politicized. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they should uh, read more Weber. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. mm. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, mm. So um, how do you, uh, last question, I mean, how to avoid unmasking? We have already touched upon some alternatives, actually. Weber sociology, and you also discussed um, how anthropologists are working. Uh, but how do you do yourself when you avoid unmasking? What are you telling yourself? How do you check yourself, so to speak? Because, I mean, we are all humans. And like you said, we are passionate, we are emotional, we, we can get into heated debates and we just we just uh, yeah perhaps engage in unmasking well it may may well be that sometimes i i do fall into unmasking I, i'm not aware of it but it is possible mm. and if, if it can be shown that that i did then i think that is a political um i think that is illegitimate to do mm -hmm. uh, i mentioned that you can you can avoid unmasking by you know, taking up a kind of Weberian approach to understanding. But you, I think you're getting at politics now, are you? Or, or, uh, no, you no, I mean, I, I'm not necessarily, I, yeah, getting at politics, but not, not really getting at politics, to be honest, more uh, to check yourself. I mean, when you are discussing politics, perhaps with a friend or with family, or, mm -hmm. or when you are uh, discussing I mean, scholarly articles, scientific works with colleagues or with other acquaintances. I mean, yeah, I mean, how do you check yourself? What are you telling yourself? Some, or, or is, is there a reminder or is it just, is it, in your, is it in your praxis, so to speak, perhaps to not engage in unmasking? Because it seems that we human beings, we are fallible and it's easy to fall perhaps in the trap of unmasking. I don't know. Well, I, I can get as passionate and, and, and heated as uh, and angry um, as, as anybody else. Yeah. And it's not really for me to say um, mm. whether I unmask or not. It's really up for other people to judge whether I do that. They can mm. read my work and they can see whether I'm unmasking or not. But I think there are ways of, of cultivating the self mm. which make one more aware. Mm. of these unmasking tropes mm. and what i think is very helpful for people to do is to read great novelists because the great novelists you know people like jane austen or um george eliot um uh, Dostoevsky, Tolstoy, these people do not unmask. Um, they show how complicated the world is. They show characters in their novels that are constantly evolving and evolving in surprising ways. They show many motives at work, some emerging, some dying out in the same person. 
And so you get a view of the human being as, as a very complicated being mm -hmm. that is doing its best, we're doing our, our best to create order in our lives, which often feel very disorderly. And so the novelists, the great novelists are geniuses of this. Remember that they're dealing with several characters in their books. And a lot of the novelists will say and have said in their memoirs and in interviews that they didn't know when the novel began how it would end. They didn't know how the characters would turn out. But suddenly, while they were writing, the characters developed their own personalities. And reading great novels and also reading cautionary moralistic works. I, I'm thinking of people like, you know, Albert Camus. I'm thinking of the 17th and 18th century French moralists like uh, Montaigne. Um, uh, gives you a sense of a human being that is struggling internally with life mm -hmm. to make sense of it, mm -hmm. and a, a complicated being. Mm -hmm. And as I keep on saying, the one of the big problems about unmasking is that it's so simple. Mm -hmm. um, we all know that our lives are difficult. Mm -hmm. They're difficult to work out. We know how little control we have over most things in our life. And um, we know that intuitively, and we know that by experience. So unmasking makes a mockery of all that by mm. reducing things to a, a so-called or apparent core, which probably doesn't even exist. It's a lazy way of thinking, and we should avoid it. So everyone is going to fall into unmasking. It's a constant temptation. It's satisfying to puncture the pomposity of somebody else and to feel mm. self-righteous. But if we're thoughtful about these things, mm. we're going to know this is not a good way to, to conduct our lives and comport ourselves. Mm. Thank you very much for that advice. And thank you very much for the interview. Um, I really appreciate that you wanted to participate. A true honor to have you here, Peter. Uh, thank you again. You're welcome. And when you when you're writing this up, um, you, you're free to give my email address to people if people want to write to me and yep. they want clarification mm -hmm. on some of these points. i will be very happy to to engage them. And, and thank you, John, for your initiative with this and for the whole series, which promises to be fascinating. Mm. Thank you very much again, Peter. All the best. Take care. You too, John. Yep. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.